Good morning and welcome to Orkney International Science Festival 2021 online in this year of Scotland's coasts and waters. My name is Eric Walker and it's my pleasure to be hosting this session. Our speaker today is Professor Helen Margolis. Helen is the Head of Science for the Time and Frequency Department at the UK National Physical Laboratory. She is also NPL Fellow in Optical Frequency Standards and Metrology. Since 2017, she's been a visiting professor at Oxford and in 2019 was awarded an MBE for her services to metrology. Today, Helen reminds us of how humans have been keeping track of time for millennia, from the use of shadows to hourglasses. And she looks at how we reached the era of atomic timekeeping and what technological advances this has made possible. And also what further developments are anticipated in coming years. I want to encourage you all to take part in this event and ask you please enter your comments and questions in YouTube's live chat and I'll present them to Helen after her talk. Helen, over to you. Thank you. Good morning and thank you very much for the introduction. So, as you've heard, I work at the National Physical Laboratory in Teddington. This is a leafy part of southwest London, if you don't know where that is. And at MPL, we measure things. We, we measure length, we measure mass, we measure electric current, we measure temperature, and we've even been known to measure the crunchiness of biscuits. But in fact, we measure pretty much any physical quantity you can think of. But all that is for another time and other speakers. Today, what I'm going to focus on is the measurement of time, which is my own field of specialism. So if we could move to the next slide, I want to start by thinking about what, what is time? So time is one of the most basic quantities in physics, but it's not actually easily understood. So unlike other physical quantities, such as length, temperature, or mass, time can't be perceived by any of our physical senses. So we can't see it, we can't hear it, we can't feel it, we can't smell it, and we can't taste it. We can't exist outside time, and we can't change the rate or the direction at which we travel through time. We also experience time passing at different rates. So when we're enjoying ourselves, for example, on holiday, time really often seems to fly by. However, the opposite situation can arise when we're waiting for something to happen. So just think of a child counting down the days till their birthday or till another special event. It seems to them as if that event will never arrive. But on the other hand, as we see in the next slide, time is incredibly useful. So we all know what time is, and the measurement of time is essential in our daily lives, whether we're going to work, meeting friends, or catching a bus. And the other point I'd like to make is that time and the related quantity of frequency can be measured with truly astounding precision, and more accurately, actually, than any other physical quantity. Which brings me on to the next slide, which is the metrologist's view of time. And the metrologist's view of time is really very simple. So from a purely operational perspective, we can just take the view that time is what we measure with a clock. And the clock measures the passage of time by counting complete oscillations or rotations of a periodic system. And humans have used various forms of clock to measure time for centuries to regulate various aspects of our lives. As we can see on the next slide, for much of history, timekeeping was just based on the motion of astronomical bodies such as the sun or the stars. Now, from the point of view of a human observer on the Earth, these objects appeared to move across the sky in a periodic way which of course we now know is due to the earth just spinning on its own axis. 
And that timekeeping was really just a matter of counting the number of times the sun passed overhead to divide time up into days. And in the earliest times, standing stones or upright sticks in the ground would have been used to cast shadows that just moved over the course of the day. But in later times, those sticks and stones evolved into the more formal sundial. But relying on natural phenomena for timekeeping has its disadvantages. For example, sundials obviously don't work unless the sun is shining. And this issue is addressed on my next slide. To, to keep track of time more accurately on cloudy days or in the dark, devices such as water clocks, candle clocks and hourglasses were developed. And later on, we got pendulum clocks with accuracy that was far, far superior to any preceding timekeeping devices. So to understand why pendulum clocks were really good, let's take a look at the next slide at the components that make up a clock. So a pendulum clock, just like any other clock, depends on something that has a regular period of oscillation. And in this case, that oscillation is the period pendulum swinging under the effect of gravity. And the clockwork in the pendulum clock counts the swings of the pendulum to measure the passage of time, and it displays this time on the clock face. Now, because the period of rotation, so a period of oscillation of the pendulum is far shorter than the daily rotation of the Earth, a pendulum clock lets you divide time up into much smaller intervals, and that makes it possible to measure seconds or even fractions of a second. So in, in other words, the shorter period of oscillation of the pendulum gives us the ability to make higher resolution timing measurements. And if you like, that's just like pixels in a digital camera image. The more pixels you have on your camera, the more precise the image will be. But it's very hard to make two pendulum clocks that tick at exactly the same rate. The period of oscillation depends on the precise length of the pendulum. And so for this reason, it was still necessary to have a kind of master clock against which the pendulum clocks and other clocks were calibrated and adjusted on a regular basis. And this master clock was the Earth's rotation. And it, what that enabled is the length of the second to be fixed in a way that everybody could agree on and refer back to. But measuring time intervals is not enough. We also need to be able to determine the time of day. And what that means is measuring the time that has elapsed since some defined starting point. Now, you might think that's easy. We, we just define midday as the time that the sun reaches its highest point in the sky, don't we? Well, yes, that's indeed what was done originally, but it led to problems. And to explain why, on the next slide, I want to take you back to my student days. So I studied at Pembroke College in Oxford, and just across the road from Pembroke is this the famous Tom Tower, which you see pictured here. That's part of the rather more famous Christchurch College. Um, and at 9.05 p.m. every evening, we were disturbed by Great Tom, which is their famous bell, ringing out exactly 101 times. And believe me, that's a lot when you have to listen to it every day. Um, the tradition of ringing the bell dates back to the foundation of the college, when the bell rang once for each of the college's original 101 students telling them to basically return to the college before the gates were locked. They obviously made students go to bed earlier in those days. But the point I want to discuss is why 9.05 p.m.? Because that seems like a bit of an odd time to choose to ring the bell. Well, if we move to the next slide now, the reason is that 9.05 p.m. is actually 9 p.m. Oxford time. So because of the rotation of the Earth, the sun reaches the highest point in the sky slightly later in Oxford than it does at the Greenwich Meridian in London. 
by about five minutes. Now, we're only talking about a matter of minutes across the whole of the UK. Um, solar time in Norwich, for example, is five minutes ahead of Greenwich, while solar, solar time in Penzance is 22 minutes behind. But back in the days of the horse and the cart, while travel and communication was very slow, this really wasn't a problem. But as we see on the next slide, the situation really changed dramatically with the introduction of the railways, when having different local times at each town and station along the rapidly expanded network started to cause real confusion. So it became clear that a single standardised time was needed. And the Great Western Railway led the way in 1840, um, and railway time was then gradually taken up by other railway companies over the next few years. Their timetables were standardised to Greenwich Mean Time, or GMT, which I'm sure you're all familiar with. And by 1855, time signals were being transmitted by telegraph from Greenwich across the British railway network. And by the mid 1950s, so 1850s, almost all public clocks in Britain were set to Greenwich Mean Time. And it finally became Britain's legal standard in 1880. Um, four years later, at the International Meridian Conference, which was held in Washington, DC, the Greenwich Meridian was adopted as the prime meridian of the world. And at the same time, GMT was proposed as the reference standard for time zones across the globe, but that wasn't without some controversy. And in fact, it took many years to be adopted by all countries around the world. So moving to the next slide, um, as technology continued to develop, the need for more precise timing continued to increase. So pendulum clocks were gradually overtaken by quartz clocks in which the crystals oscillate at far higher frequencies. And once again, by having a higher frequency of oscillation, you're splitting time up into more pieces. And so you're able to make higher resolution timing measurements. Now, quartz clocks are also less sensitive to environmental effects that might affect their frequency and that makes them more accurate. But even so, quartz clocks rely on a mechanical vibration whose frequency depends on the exact size, shape, and temperature of the crystal. And no two crystals are exactly alike, so these clocks still have to be calibrated against another reference. And that reference was the Earth's period of rotation with one second being defined as a specific fraction of the mean solar day. So one period of the Earth's rotation is one day or 86,400 seconds. However, there were problems with this definition of time and these are illustrated on my next slide. So as our ability to measure time improved, it became clear that the Earth's period of rotation is not actually constant. It's gradually slowing down due to tidal friction, and it also varies with the seasons. And what's even worse, it fluctuates in unpredictable ways. So for example, an earthquake or a tsunami can cause a small but a detectable change in the rate of the Earth's rotation. So if we put that very simply, using the clock Earth as a master clock against which we calibrate all other clocks is not actually that good an approach because the Earth's rotation isn't stable. So it isn't a good standard. Now, as is shown on the next slide, the idea that astronomical definitions of time had problems wasn't actually new. In fact, these problems have been pointed out by no less a figure than James Clark Maxwell at the 1870 meeting of the British Association for the Advancement of Science. And I'm gonna quote what he said. Yet after all, the dimensions of our earth and its time of rotation 
though relatively to our present means of comparison, very permanent and not so by physical necessity. The earth might contract by cooling, or it might be enlarged by a layer of meteorites falling on it, or its rate of revolution might slowly slacken, and yet it would continue to be as much a planet as before. Now, as we've already seen, Maxwell, Maxwell was right. The Earth's period of rotation isn't constant. But he even suggested what we could do about it. So as we see on the next slide, he went on to say, but a molecule, say of hydrogen, if either its mass or its time of vibration were to be altered in the least, would no longer be a molecule of hydrogen. If then, we wish to obtain standards of length, time and mass, which shall be absolutely permanent, we must seek them not in the dimensions or the motion or the mass of our planet, but in the wavelength, the period of vibration and the absolute mass of these imperishable and unalterable and perfectly similar molecules. Now, Maxwell was completely right. That is exactly what we do today in the international system of units, the worldwide system that metrologists agree on to use for measurement. But, but Maxwell was way ahead of his time. Science and technology simply weren't ready at that point to turn his vision into reality. The next slide illustrates the big step forward which was made at the UK National Physical Laboratory, or NPL, where I work today. And it was at NPL in 1955 that these two men, Louis Essen on the right and Jack Parry on the left, produced the first working cesium atomic clock. And that clock used a chemical element called cesium to measure time. And it really set in motion a revolution in timekeeping. My next slide illustrates how atomic clocks work. So in very simple terms, they rely on the fact that atoms only absorb electromagnetic radiation at very specific frequencies. So more specifically, cesium atoms absorb microwave radiation at a frequency that is a bit over 9 billion Hertz or 9 billion oscillations per second. So to make a clock, what we do is we tune the frequency of a microwave source so that it exactly hits the resonance frequency at which the cesium atoms absorb. And then we use a feedback loop to make sure that the frequency of the source doesn't drift away from that very specific value. So the oscillations of the microwave source act like the pendulum in the grandfather clock, providing the ticks of the clock which we count electronically. But compared to a pendulum clock, the frequency of the oscillation is orders of magnitude higher, giving us much better timing resolution. And the other point is that every cesium atom absorbs at exactly the same frequency. So in principle, anyone who builds a cesium atomic clock can be sure that it will tick at exactly the same rate. And remember, the same is not true of a pendulum clock. The tick rate depends on the length of the pendulum. Now, Essen immediately realized that cesium clocks were far superior to using the rotation of the Earth as a standard. And as we see on the next slide, he was obviously well aware that just having a fantastic new clock in his lab wasn't enough. He also needed to make the MPL authorities aware of his achievement. And he later wrote in his memoirs, we invited the director to come and witness the death of the astronomical second and the birth of atomic time. So by carefully studying how the cesium absorption frequency depended on environmental conditions, Essen definitively showed that atoms with their very specific absorption frequencies could provide a much more stable reference time interval than any standard that was based on the motion of astronomical bodies. But that wasn't enough. 
As we see on the next slide, a basic principle of metrology is that a new definition of any measurement unit should be consistent with the old one to within the measurement uncertainty. And what that meant for Essen was that he had to measure how fast his clock was ticking. And he had to measure that rate as accurately as he possibly could in terms of astronomical time scales, as realized by the Royal Observatory in Greenwich, which you see pictured here. And he achieved this measurement in collaboration with an astronomer from the United States Naval Observatory, William Markovitz. And the result they achieved in 1958 was this one that you see here. But as I've pointed out on my next slide, one person alone can't just decide to change the way the second is defined. It has to be agreed globally. The other point is that one clock on its own is not enough, because if that clock stops ticking for any reason, then we'd lose track of time. So other scientists around the world set about building their own cesium clocks and checking that they were consistent with Essence clock. And eventually, in 1967, this committee, the Consultative Committee for the Definition of the Second, decided that the time had come to redefine the second. And the second, from then on, became the duration of 9,192,631,000 770 periods of the radiation corresponding to the transition between the two hyperfine levels of the ground state of the cesium-133 atom. Or, in other words, we can count exactly this many oscillations of a microwave source tuned to the resonance frequency of the cesium atom, and that is what defines the length of the second. And this number you see here in the definition is exactly the frequency that Essen and Markovitz had measured back in 1958. So moving to the next slide, what we have found now is that the other base units, the international system of units, have followed where the second has led. In 1983, the meter was redefined in terms of the speed of light in a vacuum. And in 2019, no fewer than four base units, the kilogram, the Kelvin, the ampere, and the mole, were redefined in terms of other fundamental physical constants. At the same time, it was decided that the definitions of all the base units should be written in the same form. And so the definition of the second was tweaked a bit to the form of the words you see here. But this really was just a change of phrasing there was no change to how that definition was realized in practice. And in fact, the choice of the cesium transition back in 1967 as the basis for the definition has proved to be a very, very good choice. Um, as illustrated on the next slide, um, cesium, sorry, can I have the next slide please? Cesium clock technology has involved, sorry, no, the Previous one. Uh, thanks. Cesium clock technology has evolved significantly since Essence Day, and this has enabled enormous gains in precision to be achieved. So, Essence's first clock had an accuracy of approximately 10 microseconds per day. And that might seem very, very good, but today that makes it a museum piece. And in fact, it sits in the making of the Modern World Gallery in the Science Museum in London. Today's best cesium atomic clocks look like what you see on the right of this slide, and they have accuracies nearly a million times better. They're quite a bit more complicated than Essence first clock, but the principles are fundamentally the same. And the big difference is really that in Essence clock, the atoms are hot, Whereas in today's cesium fountain atomic clocks, they are really, really cold, just a few thousandths of a degree above absolute zero. So what difference does that make? Well, if the atoms are hot, they jiggle about more. And when an atom moves, 
the frequency at which it absorbs changes slightly due to the Doppler effect. That's the same effect that causes the apparent change in pitch of the siren on the police car as it passes by. So depending whether the atom is moving towards or away from the microwave source, its absorption frequency is different. And that makes the frequency of the clock less stable. Obviously, the less the atoms jiggle about better, and so cooler atoms make better clocks. And the clock you see pictured here on the right is the primary reference for the UK national time scale. And it also contributes to the international time scale coordinated universal time or UTC for short. That's the time scale which globally we have agree agreed should be used as the basis for all civil timekeeping. But who cares about having such accurate clocks? Well, actually we all do. My next slide shows how time has become a kind of invisible utility. So we might not always realize it, but precision timing underpins many of the technologies we've come to depend on in our daily lives. So mobile phones, the internet, financial trading, electric power grids and satellite navigation systems all rely on time and frequency standards to operate properly. Without stable and accurate timing, they simply wouldn't work. For example, modern digital telecommunications networks rely on accurate synchronization to ensure that the switches routing the digital signals through the networks all operate at the same rate. So if they didn't, data packets would end up getting lost or arriving at the wrong time, and that would result in garbled messages. So as we become more and more reliant on the telephone and the internet, we're becoming more dependent on atomic clocks. Satellite navigation systems also rely on accurate atomic clocks. This time, set clocks on board the satellites orbiting the Earth. So GPS works by measuring the time it takes for signals to get from the satellite clocks to your receiver on the ground. And by looking at the signals from four or more satellites, it's possible for the receiver to calculate your position from these timing signals. But those signals travel very fast. To be precise, they travel at the speed of light. And that's 300 million meters per second or 30 centimeters in one nanosecond. So the clocks have to be incredibly accurate because a tiny error in the time signal could end up putting you off course by a very long way. Satellite navigation systems have really proved very, very effective in situations such as Arctic expeditions where navigation by traditional landmarks and signposts is impossible and they'll certainly be critical to the future of driverless cars. But GPS isn't just used for navigation. It's used for, by emergency crews to locate people in need of assistance, to map forests, to track objects in warehouses, or even to help farmers harvest their fields. So the applications of GPS and by implication of precision timing are continually increasing. So if clocks are already so accurate, what could the future possibly hold? Well, we're not allowing time to stand still. And at NPL, we're working on a new generation of what we call optical atomic clocks, illustrated on my next slide. So these clocks work by absorbing laser light at very specific optical frequencies, rather than by absorbing microwaves. They also use, in this case, these are the MPL clocks shown here, which are using strontium and ytterbium atoms rather than cesium atoms. But whether we use light or microwaves, cesium or another type of atom, the principles of how the clocks work are exactly the same. The atoms absorb only at very, very specific frequencies. Now, Again, laser frequencies or optical frequencies are roughly 100,000 times higher than microwave frequencies. So you're probably detecting the common theme here. Optical frequencies give us even higher timing resolution. 
in the same way that measurement precision improved by moving from pendulum clocks, clock, pendulum clocks to quartz clocks to cesium atoms. And as in the cesium fountain, the atoms are cooled using lasers to very low temperatures, just a few thousand to the degree above absolute zero. And we're still refining these clocks, but ultimately we expect that they'll be about 100 times better than the best current cesium fountain clocks. With the result being that at some point in the future, we're likely to see another redefinition of the second. And just to put this accuracy in context, the frequencies of these new optical clocks will be accurate to 18 decimal places. That's equivalent to losing or gaining no more than just one second in the current lifetime of the universe. Now, that's so accurate, in fact, that they'll stop being devices for measuring time. So what will they measure? Well, as indicated on my next slide, they'll actually start to measure gravity. So Einstein's theory of relativity tells us that clocks in different gravity potentials tick at different rates. And this might not be the equation you're expecting to see when I say Einstein's name, but what it tells us is that the bigger the gravity potential difference between two clocks, the larger the difference in their tip rates will be. The stronger the gravity potential a clock experiences, the slower it ticks, which is quite easy to remember because lower is slower. Or alternatively, you can explain away your gray hair by saying that your head is aging faster than your feet. Now, of course, that difference is not exactly big. Actually, it's just a few nanoseconds per year. Or equivalently, if I lift a clock up by one meter at the surface of the Earth, its frequency changes at the 16th decimal place. But as I've already told you, optical clocks are so accurate that they can easily detect this kind of change. And in the end, they'll be able to detect changes in gravity potential that are equivalent to height changes of just one centimeter at the Earth's surface. And a few years ago, I worked with some scientists from other labs around Europe to show for the first time that it was possible to use a transportable optical clock to measure gravity potentials in that way. But we didn't just want to do a normal lab experiment here. We wanted to do a demonstration on the kind of realistic test bed. So as illustrated on my next slide, we decided to use a transportable optical clock developed by my colleagues from PTB in Germany to measure the gravity potential in the middle of a mountain. More specifically, in the middle of the Freyus road tunnel that runs through the Alps between France and Italy. Now, located just off the middle of this tunnel is a laboratory. It's called the Medan Underground Laboratory, and it sits beneath about 1,700 meters of rock. Now, this laboratory in the middle of the tunnel is nothing like the nice temperature controlled laboratories we were all used to back home. Really, it's more like a kind of cave full of scientific equipment. And it was designed for particle physics experiments, not highly accurate metrology. In the tunnel, it was extremely hot and the temperature fluctuations were very large. The background noise levels were very, very high, and none of that is good for trying to get optical clocks, which are still experimental devices, to work well. The working hours were also very, very restricted for safety reasons, which led to a number of frustrated scientists who had to pack up and leave for the day just as soon as they got things to work. And to make it things even more challenging, a new tunnel was being blasted through the mountain and they reached the closest point to the existing laboratory at more or less exactly the same time we got our experiment running. And the result was that we had to evacuate the lab every time there was an explosion and they blew a new bit of rock out of the mountain. But we did eventually manage to measure the gravity potential difference 
between the clock sitting in the middle of the mountain in Medan and a reference clock sitting in Turin in Italy. Now, the measurement we made wasn't yet competitive with conventional ways of making such measurements, but what we did demonstrate was the potential of the technique to surpass, surpass these conventional methods once the accuracy and the reliability of the transportable clocks has been improved. But again, what, why should we care? Well, some reasons are given on my next slide. With optical clocks, it will in future be possible to make measurements of the Earth's gravity potential at very specific points. And what that will do is it will give us data with much higher spatial resolution than what we get from satellite missions such as Gochi or GRACE, which give us global coverage of the gravity potential, but give us average values over length scales of about 100 kilometers. Now, measuring gravity potentials might seem a bit abstract, but it does have real applications. Um, so first of all, at the moment, different countries measure height above sea level in different ways. And in the past, this has led to actually rather costly and embarrassing mistakes in engineering projects. So one infamous example is the construction of the Hochrhein Bridge, which straddles the River Rhine between Germany and Switzerland. And partway through construction, it became clear that construction on the two sides of the bridge differed by 54 centimetres. And that mistake had its origins in the fact that Germany measures height relative to a reference point in Amsterdam on the North Sea, whereas Switzerland measures height relative to a reference point in Marseille on the Mediterranean Sea. And the point to realize is that sea level isn't the same everywhere on Earth. So those two versions of sea level differ by 27 centimeters. Now, the engineers knew that, but they applied the correction with the wrong sign. And what that meant was that the difference got doubled instead of being reduced to zero. Um, of course, further checks might have fixed that problem, but optical clocks could be used in the future to bring consistency between different national height systems, introducing a global standard and avoiding the possibility of problems like that arising. Optical clocks could also be used to monitor changes in gravity potential. For example, they could be used to monitor changing sea levels in real time, allowing us to track seasonal and long-term trends in ice sheet masses and overall ocean mass changes. And this kind of data provides critical input into models that are used to study and forecast the effects of climate change. So, to summarize on my final slide, I hope you'll agree that we've come a long way from using sticks and stones to tell the time. And um, as I've already shown you, MPL was the birthplace of atomic time and it remains the home of UK time today. People might still talk about Greenwich Mean Time, but I assure you the official UK time comes from MPL. The Royal Observatory in Greenwich hasn't maintained an atomic time scale since 1985. Our current primary frequency standard at MPL, cesium fountain atomic clocks, are accurate now to 20 picoseconds per day. And our next generation optical clocks will be 100 times better still. And who knows what this accuracy might lead to? Almost certainly inventions that we haven't even thought of yet. And we're delivering accurate and trusted time to users across the UK with services such as the MSF radio time signal, our internet time service, and our MPL time, time over fibre service, enabling people to navigate safely, conduct financial transactions, and communicate with friends and colleagues. So that's it from me, a very brief history of timekeeping. Thank you for listening, and I'll be really happy to take any questions you might have. Helen, that was absolutely fantastic. I was enthralled by that, that talk. <laughs>
Um, I'm an enthusiastic amateur astronomer, and mm -hmm. I have to say, I was able to relate all the talk uh, from the ancient to the mm -hmm. the now to the potential future, still to astronomy. So mm -hmm. I'll, I'll, there might be a little thread comes through here. I was wondering, see, in early times, you know, when travellers and nomads were going from settlement to settlement, I wonder how they communicated time, you know, the, I'm not sure. Would they have had a common standard or was it at all even important to them? I mean, my my guess is it was only of limited performance. I mean, because we were talking about days there. So they cared maybe about, yeah, well, when was it time to eat, <laughs> um, get up, go to bed? And I guess they just were driven by the daylight hours. Yeah. So probably communication was so slow that they yeah, didn't need much more than that. They probably only needed a course measure. It didn't have to have any precision. Yeah. yeah. And it, it's really timekeeping evolving in in parallel with technology and the speed of communication and navigation. I think they're just so inherently linked. Yeah. That was interesting. You mentioned navigation there, and we all know that there was a, a tremendous search for a timepiece, you know, that could uh, measure accurately accurate keep mm -hmm. accurate time so that the longitudinal element of navigation yeah was in the four was was um what was yeah what, what was that how did they how did people how did they arrive at that because i think there was a famous court if i remember right. yeah so this was um harrison so so they basically the the government because of the problem of, of keeping time at sea um launched a prize a, a competition for a prize for somebody, I can't remember what the accuracy they specified for the clock, but there was a, it, it was like a few minutes, I think, in an Atlantic crossing to enable people to keep time at sea on that kind of journey. And it took many, many years um, for anyone to win the prize. There's a, there's a whole book about the court longitude, um, about this kind of race to build these clocks. But basically, if you go to the Royal Observatory, you will see... Harrison's four different clocks that he built successively to try and improve and, and get to the point where he could win that prize, which he did eventually. Um, but what's fascinating to me, they're beautiful clocks, but the one that finally won the prize is the least impressive looking of the lot because it's much smaller and much simpler than the first three. Um, it looks a bit more like a, a fancy pocket watch. Yeah. Um, and wasn't it wonderful when Del Boy and Rodney found one in the lockup garage? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'll tell you the, that was interesting about the, the GMT being adopted as the um, you know the 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 point, the line that was the, the standard of time comes from for us. How long did that actually take to be adopted? You, you mentioned there was um, it it varied a lot from country to country. Um, I think. Not completely sure, but I think the last countries didn't adopt this till something like some point in the 1920s. So from the Meridian Conference in 1884, it still took decades. That there was a lot of controversy between the UK and France about this because the French wanted the Paris Meridian to be the worldwide reference. So Yeah, that, that's that's not unusual for the, those times, yeah. is it? <laughs> yeah. The, 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 um, other interesting one uh, with with um, that was uh, oh yeah no I'll tell you what it was it was you're talking about the use of the Earth's rotation as the that was where the period of the definition of the second arose from. It got me thinking was see could the Dinesh, the detonation of nu of hydrogen bombs nuclear bombs thermonuclear testing would would that have had an impact on the Earth's rotation significantly enough? I don't know how big that effect would be, but yes, potentially. Um, yeah, yeah the, the, I mean, if a, if a tsunami can have a measurable effect, then maybe, although I suppose the mass involved there is a lot larger. Yeah, the follow-up with that one was, yeah. with the like of tsunamis, which you know do have impacts and earthquakes have impacts, does it go back to its normal speed again? You know, does it accelerate or decelerate? No. Again? No, normal speed is a bit hard to quantify because it does a bit um, 
unpredictable things anyway. So actually, you, if you go onto the website of the Interna International Earth Rotation and Reference Systems Service, mm -hmm. um, you can actually get plots of what the Earth's rotation rate has looked like over the past oh, many, many years. Um, and you'll see all kinds of like oscillations. So at the moment, the Earth is actually speeding up for some reason. Um, so, but on average, it's definitely been slowing down. Yeah. So I'm, these tsunamis are probably relatively small scale fluctuations on top of the larger fluctuation that you see. Yeah, I'm definitely going to have to try and find that site now and have them yeah. go, and, go and find that data. Yeah. The, this one is a related question. You, um, you mentioned uh, the impact of like climate change and we have sea level rise and consequently that, you know, you've got a redistribution of water, a redistribution mm -hmm. of mass mm -hmm. on the planet. Mm -hmm. Could that be having the... the, the, the yeah, I mean, of, of course, this will also affect the rotation rate. I mean, I was talking about it in a different context, but yes, the redistribution of mass will clearly affect the rotation rate, yes. Yeah, yeah it really does. It really gets my mind thinking you're talking. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, what Richard's asking, why was the element cesium selected for developing the atomic clock? Yeah, that, that's a good question. I mean, I think at the time it probably just had a number of technical advantages so i mean one point would be that it has a, a reference frequency that was at a convenient one for microwave source technology that existed at the time um, another point is that it actually has a relatively low point of, it, you can get good vapor pressure from cesium at a relatively low temperature compared with some elements so this is convenient for creating the vapor that you need for clocks. Um, but I'd say it's really, it's fortuitous that it's still a good element today because I mentioned that we use really, really cold atoms and this needs lasers to cool, cool them down. And it's just chance really that cesium turned out to be a really good laser system for laser cooling as well. Yeah. Um, it has convenient wavelengths that are accessible using standard laser technology and so on so so that's just that that could so easily not have been the case it seems yeah. to me so an element of luck but yeah maybe a bit more than that yeah i was i loved the end i love the end and where, where you came in about the, the future and you were talking about optical clocks mm -hmm. and potentially gravity type mm -hmm. clocks and we had a presentation from martin henry yesterday about gravitational waves and it got me mm -hmm. thinking because the two are related is there any technology or techniques from the LIGO technology that could be applied to the development of the type of time measuring device that you were? Yeah, that, that's an excellent question. And absolutely, we are already using technology that's very similar to the LIGO technology. So, I mean, I didn't go into any of the details about how the optical clocks work, but we need really, really stable laser sources to probe the reference transitions in the clocks. And when I say stable, what we do is we lock a laser, stabilize a laser to a very, very stable reference cavity, which is quite similar to what they're doing in LIGO, but on a much smaller scale. And so our cavities need to be stable. They're probably something like half a meter long, and their length needs to be stable to about the diameter of a new atomic nucleus. So this is completely crazy stability. But what we do is we use mirror technology that's very, very similar to the LIGO mirror technology. And the stabilization techniques are quite similar as well. So the things that limit them, like just the movement of the atoms in the mirror coatings, are the same things that limit the stability of our cavities in the end. So, yeah. That's wonderful. I love it when you can apply things from yeah. very, very new <laughs> front end research into yeah. another um, discipline. I think that's great. Yeah. Well, Helen, would you believe it? Time has <laughs> caught up with us. 
and we have to finish there. Um, I'd just like to take the opportunity to thank everyone, the viewers who have taken part in this event and who have submitted some very um, uh, perceptive questions. Um, I would just also like to uh, give you some festival information. Could I ask you to complete a feedback form for us here in the festival? There's a link to it in the YouTube description below. Thank you for doing that. It helps us so much shaping things for the future events. And of course, Helen, thank you so much for that fascinating, enlightening and timely talk. Apologies for the pun. <laughs> Uh, I wish I'd think that uh, this talk is going to make me much more efficient use of time when I'm preparing for my talks, but unfortunately it looks like it's just going to more precisely measure how right up to the wire I tend to be when I do my presentations. Anyway, for everyone, the next event in the programme is the Dr Ewan McKee Memorial, Memorial Lecture on the Mathematics of the Neolithic at 11.30am, featuring our very own Howie Firth and I'll look into the thinking of 5,000 years ago. If you're enjoying the festival, please consider donating. Full details of how to do so are below. And don't forget to like us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram, and follow our YouTube channel. And please remember the Festival Club will again be open this evening at half past nine. Thank you all, and goodbye for now. <laughs>